sit together in the presence of the Lord in John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 4. If you're seated and you've turned to John's Gospel, you just say, I'm ready to go. That doesn't mean leave this planet. That means enter into God's plan. <laughs> Although some of us might be ready for the new heaven and the new earth, he's got plans right here first. <laughs> Get to John chapter 4, just say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Today I want to continue. Lord, be with us as we enter your word. Holy Spirit, would you be the great teacher and the great revealer? Would you move us from our own beliefs, our own traditions, our own conclusions? Would you move us into the reality of spirit and truth? Make us true worshipers now as we enter your living word. In the mighty name of Jesus. We're at John 4, and today I want to talk about race, reconciliation, and the cross. But particularly, I want to talk about common ground. Could everybody say common ground? Common ground, C common ground is a place of, of shared belief. Common ground is a place of shared experience. Common ground is a place where Human beings come together, and in spite of all of their differences, in spite of their different ethnicities, their different beliefs, their different experiences, their different hurts, their different pains, their different abilities or inabilities, common ground is the place that we come together and we all feel united there. I remember when I went to my first Penn State Nittany Lions game, there was over 100,000 people in the stadium, and it seemed like whenever that Nittany Lions sound went, it was everybody was united. We were all the same. Didn't matter what color we were, didn't matter what town we were from, didn't matter whether we were alumni or not, we were all there wanting the Nittany Lions to win, and that place became common ground. Our differences faded away, and the fact that we were all rooting for and believing for the same outcome united us. Common ground is a place of shared experience. If a person is sick, they don't ask you what is your educational background to go to the hospital. They don't ask you much about anything. The hospital becomes a place of common ground for people who are looking for health and restoration. The hospital can become common ground, and our differences don't matter when we go there. Common ground is a place where our judgments and our conclusions about people and about things fade to the back and we come together. When you go to sporting events, we end up on common ground. When, when we go to places where we receive services in the community, we end up on common ground. But the sad thing is that when we come to church, the church that is born out of the person of Jesus Christ, that place does not become common ground. Too often in America, when we come to the church, instead of a place of common ground, it becomes a place of separation. But when I read in my Bible in Revelations 5, 9, Revelation 7, 9, I see an eternity that God has designed for us where he says it's people of every nation, it's people of every tongue, it's people of every tribe, it's people of every background. Maybe you're here today and you don't like being the ethnicity that you are. You might as well get over it because God says we're going to have those ethnicities for eternity. I think some people picture heaven will be the place where we'll all look the same and be the same. We'll all be big fat angels flying around, but we won't. The Bible paints the picture that what makes us different now will still make us different for eternity. And if that is the case, then if we're going to live together in Christ in eternity in a new heaven and a new earth, there is a reality of the kingdom of God that God wants us to discover and learn to live in now. It's funny how we want so many of the other things that the kingdom promises, but others will say we'll wait on. But God is not wanting us to wait on diverse people, diverse tongues, diverse experiences coming together. In fact, when I look at my news, I think, what would it be like if the church was diverse? How competent and powerful and anointed of a voice we would be to be able to speak into certain circumstances and situations. We'd be able to tell how God healed us and worked us together. And we're not together just shallow. We've gone deep with each other. 
We know one another's stories. We know one another's hurts. We know life from one another's perspectives and viewpoints. And God, Jesus himself, by the Holy Spirit, has made us a people common ground. When we come together, we're different, but we're one. Are, are you ready for this in the scriptures? Because so often, common ground is just a shared experience on the surface. But common ground is also a place, as we're going to learn today, that God wants to call us deep into the lives of one another. God wants to move us beyond just sharing a pretzel and a soda and cheering together. And then when we leave, we go to our own neighborhoods, our own places, and wouldn't be caught dead near the person. But he wants to bring us to the place that on common ground, he calls us while we're there in one experience, he wants to call us deep into another experience. Where he starts weaving our lives together and the thing that unites us is Christ and the things that gives us strength is our differences. I want to get into this. Let's look together at John's gospel chapter 4 as we get into the word and God begins to renew our minds about common ground. Verse 1, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs Go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sukkar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. It was about noon. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Traveling from Judea to Galilee, Judea is in the southern part of the Israeli-Palestinian region. And uh, Galilee is in the northern part of the Israel-Palestinian uh, region. In fact, it's a straight shot to go from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, it's about a 70-mile straight shot. The thing is, no good, practicing, believing Jew would ever take the straight shot to get to Galilee. Any good, practicing, believing Jew would never take the straight shot because to take the straight 70-mile journey straight up would mean you had to go through Samaria. And no good practicing, believing Jew would ever go through Samaria. It was already understood by the Jewish people of that day that if you wanted to go from Judea to Galilee, you had to go northeast through Perea and then get up into Galilee because we don't have anything to do with the Samaritans. Verse 4 here when it says, and he must needs go through Samaria is a verse that is so packed with kingdom truth. If you, if you didn't understand the context, if you didn't understand what was going on, you'd miss the whole story. It's like if you weren't from this part of the world and somebody said we would never go through and they mentioned the town, only the people that lived in that region would understand what they meant when they said that. But when you said Samaria, everybody understood that was a racist comment. For, for me not to go through Samaria, for me to take the longer route, was because something had become so entrenched in what I believed. Something had become so deep into my thinking that we don't even think about it. Everybody knows the way to get there is this way. Nobody even says, unless they're not from around there, why would you go around? But the Bible says that Jesus must needs go through Samaria because Jesus won't allow racial differences to impede the kingdom of God. Jesus said he must needs go through Samaria because he would not buy into their cultural preferences. 
Jesus, although ethnically he was a Jew, he was unwilling to buy into the prejudice, the racism, and the hatred of his day. So when he had to go from Judea to Galilee, he had to go through Samaria. See, the Samaritans were Jewish people that lived in the northern region of the old kingdom of Israel, but their land had long ago been invaded by the Assyrians. Do some history, you'll see this. And when the Samaritan land became invaded by the Assyrians, the Assyrians intermarried with those northern Jewish people, and those northern Jewish people moved, as the Jews would say, from being pure Jews into becoming a mixed breed. In fact, the colloquial name for Samaritans was Samaritan dogs. <laughs> that was the popular name for them during this time among the people that were still considering themselves pure Jews because they were not the product of interracial marriage. You, you got to get the scene here. The scene here is that we don't go through Samaria because they're not pure. Those are people that are the result of interracial marriages. And don't you sit there judging the Jews because every one of us sitting here has preferences like that locked in our heart right now. I see certain people and I immediately think certain things. If you're from that place, I immediately have a conclusion about you. If you didn't do this, I know this about you. And we live with all these prejudgments and the prejudgments direct us more than God. Don't you sit there saying, well, I'm glad I'm not a Jew today because you sit there like me. I stand here with so many preferences in my heart that I need the Holy Spirit to say to me, Kevin, you must go through Samaria. It's almost like a wake-up call. You know, we prefer certain people and certain places and certain things, but where did you get the preference from? Did God give you the preference? Because in many ways, the preference has shaped us more than he has. And God is saying, I want you to go where I want you to go. I want to lead you where I want to lead you. I want to bring you to the conclusions I want to bring you to. I want to shape you more than your skin shapes you. <laughs> I want to give you an identity, not take from you your ethnicity, because I told you in eternity you'll still have it, but I want to shape you from my viewpoint. Are, are you ready for this? Yeah, we didn't want to go there. We didn't want to go through Samaria because those were the people that were the result of interracial marriaging and marriage, and we don't want to have anything to do with that. So we go through Perea. Nobody goes through Samaria, but Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Look at verse 9. It gets much deeper. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that you, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a Samaritan woman or a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have what? What do they do? With the Samaritans. Oh, it's interesting to note here that Jesus didn't try to hide his Jewishness. How did she know he was a Jew if normally Jews don't come around them parts? They're obviously, when you physically looked at Jesus, you could look at his attributes and tell that he was a Jew. You, you got to get this. His mother Mary was a Jew. His, his father Joseph was a Jew. So although he was the word made flesh, when you just looked at him according to his flesh, he looked like a Jew. Can you imagine that some of us would have been prejudiced against the Messiah? Some of us would have missed the Messiah because I don't want my Messiah in that package. How many things do some of us miss today because I don't want my blessing in that package. I don't want my boss looking like that. I don't want my friends in that package. And what do we miss? Because I don't like what he's clothed with. Jesus didn't hide his Jewishness. She looked at him and said, oh, he's a Jew. What are you doing around these parts? you got to get this. I know I just hear about the Spirit of God. Some of us are praying and believing for things and seeking God for some things, but we've been moving away from some things because of our judgments. And, and our judgments have literally caused us to miss God. But thank God he's delivering us right now. We're getting free right now. And we're getting released from this stuff right now. 
She goes on in verse 10, Jesus answered her, mind you that all that response in verse 9 was racist. It was prejudice. She said, what you doing around here? We don't have nothing to do with y'all. What you doing in my neighborhood? You know, normally what follows that is a whistle. <laughs> Maybe if only you're from where I'm from. Let me, that was an ebonic reference. Let me help you. Like, if you were in a certain neighborhood and somebody who wasn't supposed to be in the neighborhood was in the neighborhood, you just gave a little whew, whew, and then everybody knows, and that's like, yo, yo, we got somebody here that shouldn't be here. She, he didn't know if she was getting ready to give the yo, yo, or what. But I love the courage of Jesus because even when that comet comes that would have tried to drive him into fear, even when the comet comes that would drive, try to drive him into a carnal judgment, even when the com comet comes that says, I don't even know why I listen to verse 4, I'm going back out through Perea like everybody else, but Jesus stands strong in verse 10. And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, I say that to us. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him. He starts talking about himself in the third person. Jesus is so cool. He, he said, you would have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. She's still in the natural. And the well is deep from where then has you this living water? I can imagine she said that with some sarcasm. Are you greater? Now she goes into more of where their judgments come from. Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Verse 12 talks about the fact that Jesus was standing on common ground. Why was this common ground? Because the Jews revered Jacob. He was the God of Abraham and Isaac and that was your part. And, and, the, and, the, and the Samaritans revered Jacob because what gave them their stake in the Jewish lineage, what gave them their stake in saying that we are the true people of God, what, what was a common ground but also drew a line in the ground was the fact that she said, well, the well is on the land that we live in. Y'all don't have a well where you live in. The, are you better than the, the well? The well was given to us, and we live in it. So what was common ground was trying to become dividing ground because of their historical experience. Are you digging into this with me? This is key because Jesus, again, does not allow these cultural differences to override the love of God. Let me go even further. Jesus doesn't allow these cultural differences to override the leading of God. Have you ever been led of God somewhere on common ground, but then you get a response that you don't like, and it pushes you back into your cultural preference? Have you ever gone to extend the love of God, but when the love of God was rejected, and none of us like rejection, we went into our screw head tapes and started replaying, oh, that's why I don't even come around, I can't even stay in here. So, you know, we went into our whole internal dialogue that shut down the dialogue that brought us there, and now we're in our flesh there. But the Holy Spirit led him, as, as verse 4 tells us, to a place of common ground. Jacob's well was a, a place of common ground, and Jesus wasn't going to let that change. You know, sometimes you could be at the game, you cheer for the same team, your face is painted blue, their face is painted blue, but then they bump you in the line, and they tell you get out the way, and all of a sudden you go back into your negative dialogue. Are, are you getting this? Now you're at the game, and your attitude changed at the game. You're at the hospital, but they call someone else's name, and you thought you were in an emergency room before that person, and all of a sudden a place of common ground tries to turn into a ground of division. Are, are, are you getting this? Some, sometimes I'm, I get pulled over by the police, and they provide safety to everyone in the town, and they're looking out for everyone in town. That should be a place of common ground that when they come, safety comes. But because of your culture experiences, you see two different things. When something that should be common ground comes, are, are, are you getting this? And this happens to Jesus because she tries to make the well something different, but Jesus doesn't allow the well to become something different. He keeps the well being the same place of common ground that God has called him to. Can I just say that God is calling us to places of common ground? 
You think you're going to the game just to see the game, and, and the Holy Ghost is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I got Kev next to Rebecca, and if I could just get Kevin to hear me and to say what I want him to say to Rebecca, I can pierce through the veils that they leave behind, and I can actually cause a divine connection to happen today. You know, the, the Holy Spirit is always saying, oh, I'm glad I finally got Michelle sitting next to Mary at church service because now I want Michelle to invite Mary out to coffee. And when they go out to coffee and start sharing their stories, I'm going to be able to bring about great healing between them. And them talking is going to be a pivotal moment in their lives. They're going to go to work and never see their coworkers the same again. They're going to move from the fear and the timidity that they used to have. And they're going to be who I've made them to be in that place. The beautiful thing about history is it often gives us identity. The ugly thing about history is it often gives us identity. So God is calling us to places of common ground, but not only calling us to places of common ground, then he's calling us to become common ground. This is a little difference because when we become common ground, then we allow our cultural differences to, to stop dictating to us, and we allow God to start dictating to us. How often do your cultural differences dictate to you? For most of us, it depends on where I am. If, if I'm in one place, it's, 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 it's low, it's, it's minimal. But when I get in other places, it raises. Understand where Jesus was, his cultural difference meter should have been on a 10. It would have been for most, but his cultural difference meter was all the way down to none. He was more in tune with the person of the Holy Spirit than he was with the person of his flesh. Are, are you getting this? And I'm not in the least bit suggesting that that means for you to stop being Italian from South Philly. I'm not in the least bit suggesting that means stop being the brother from, from the Northeast. I'm not in the least bit suggesting that means stop being the suburbanite from Voorhees. I'm not in the least bit suggesting that means stop being the inner city person from Camden. What I'm suggesting is let God define you even more than that, though. It's who I am. I'm not hiding who I am. I'm not hiding where I'm from. But I won't let where I'm from dictate to me. I will let where I'm going dictate to me. Ver verse 14. Uh, let's, let's go to verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, whosoever drinketh of this water, we're talking about Jacob's well, we're talking about natural water, whoever drinks of this shall do what? But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall. But the water that I shall give shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The conversation moved from natural, it moved from historical, and now Jesus starts to get spiritual. Are you with me? It moved from talking about the game. It moved from talking about who, who, who's going to win, who's your favorite player in the team. And it moved to something spiritual. It moved from where do you live. It moved from is this your mom that you're in the emergency room with. And it moved to something spiritual. It moved from, oh, my kid's on the team too. What position does your kid play? What neighbor do you live in? And it moved to something spiritual. It moved from I just came to get my groceries and I'm trying to get back home. I don't want to meet him. And it moved from where are the eggs to something spiritual. God wants to use these places of common ground to become places where we move from conversations and thoughts and habits that are natural and we move into something spiritual. He's reconciling his body. I know we got important stuff to do every day and I know we up the real important stuff everywhere we go, but there's nothing more important than this big kingdom work that's going on that overlays everything that's going on and God is reconciling his body. And his body is diverse. His body, as Revelations 5, 9 and Revelations 7, 9 tells us, is made up of people from every nation, people of every tongue, people of every tribe, people of every background. So I've got to be about my father's business. I must needs go through Samaria too. How about you? Seven people will be enough. Verse 14, but whosoever drinketh of that water that I shall give him shall never thirst again, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, sir, 
He's intriguing her with this. Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. And Jesus said, and now gets real spiritual. Go call your husband and come here. Now he's moved beyond the surface of the well. He's moved beyond the conversation about the neighborhood. He's moved beyond their surfacey religious dialogue. He's gotten invited into her heart. Now he's in her stuff. Some must say, well, pastor, the spirit of God don't use me like that. I've never had God reveal anything like that to me before. Because we're too busy in the natural dialogue to get over into the spiritual dialogue. Because your opinions speak so loud when you're with people that you can't even hear God speaking when you're with people. If we were quieter and less prejudiced and less judgmental, and less stuck in our own conclusions, we would always hear God nudging us to his conclusions as we talked, as we interacted. And Lord, for those that have never experienced that, for those that have never found themselves into the gifts of your spirit, I pray that you would fill them with the Holy Spirit right now, even as I'm preaching. I read in Acts that as the word was preached, that the word fell on Gentiles and Gentiles. While Peter was even speaking, the Holy Spirit fell, and they began to speak in other tongues, and they began to prophesy, and they began to flow in the gift of spirit. I pray that our service today would be that alive, that you'd be that present, that we'd be that open, that those of us who have never experienced flowing with you like that would move from where we were to where you are now by faith in the mighty name of Thank you, Lord. Say, I got that. I got that. I'm, I'm, I'm getting that. I'm, I'm taking that. Go call your husband and come here. <laughs> uh, 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 the woman answered and said, um, um, yo, like, uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't have a husband. And Jesus, Jesus, Jesus said to her, you've well said. I have no husband. For you have had... That's even a lot for Hollywood. <laughs> you have had how many? Five. What? <laughs> and it gets worse because he said, and, 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 and whom thou now has is not thy husband. I've read that over and over this week and meditated. Jesus, were you trying to say she was shacking up and living with a man out of wedlock? Or Jesus, were you trying to say the dude you're messing with now is married? You're with somebody and he's not even your, he's not, he's not your husband. I couldn't tell, was he accentuating the thy or was he accentuating where they were living or how they, either way they were in sin. Did everybody hear me? Whether they were shacking up or, or whether she was just messing with a man that was already married. I, Jesus doesn't even make the designation because in his eyes they're equally wrong. Everybody say, that was for me. <laughs> All right, nobody. <laughs> just, just look straight. And, uh, I might be getting like Jesus and reaching in your business. Just look straight. Then look at verse 19. Now it's spiritual. The woman said unto him, Sir, well, she, she's not stuttering, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. See, crossing cultural and crossing racial and crossing our judgments open up the door to reach into the heart of one another's lives. See, you think that your judgments are safe. You think your judgments don't get in the way. You think your conclusions keep you protected. I got to know and be aware and know what's going on. But all you're protecting yourself also keeps you from the moves of God. All of you, I look out for myself. I got to be aware of why. And it's true that God says be wise as a serpent. But then he also says and be harmless as a dove. See, doves don't bite. Doves represent peace. Doves represent joy. Doves represent trust. Serpents represent, I'll get you before you get me. I see what you're up to. I'm going to bite you now. So he says, it's all right if you have that wisdom, but don't let that wisdom inform you. 
Don't let that wisdom control you. And it almost sounds strange. He says, be aware, but as you're aware, let me inform you how to act. You've got to get this. Because normally when I see, I know what you're up to, and I start talking about you. I see, I come to my conclusion, I start getting my little huddle together. Because I see what homie's up to, and y'all down with me. If something go down, y'all with me, right? Because I might have to go in his mouth. That was all Ebonics for. That was all Ebonics for. I perceive I'm in a dangerous situation. And I've come to the conclusion I will have to protect myself. So I start working stuff in the natural. But Jesus didn't. He, he, he didn't do that at all. In fact, Jesus went, not get provoked to stay in the natural. And this is Satan's game. I'll keep you locked in your natural conclusions. And if you want to keep getting the same results, just keep keeping the same thoughts. <laughs> so Jesus gets invited all the way in our life. He crosses cultural, racial, historical, even the present offense that she tried to give to him, and he gets to the heart of this Samaritan woman. Their conversation went from a shared natural need that we need some water right now because it was noon, Jesus needed water, she needed water, but it went from water to an unmet spiritual need. It went from talking about something natural to talking about something supernatural. God the Holy Spirit had invited God the Word into that. And guess what? He wants to do the same thing with the body of Christ. If we're the body of Christ, then that means we should be doing the same thing Christ did when he had his body on the earth. If we're, if we're the body of Christ, that means we should be having movements and following and results the same we did. And people say, Pastor, where are the gifts at in the church? Where are the miracles at in the church? I'm saying, where are they at in the city? Where are the miracles at in the street? They were out in the street at the well. We need this stuff happening at the well. We want it to happen in here so we can keep it all in here. Do we want? Jesus wants it to happen out there. Look where most of those miracles happened. They happen when we're on common ground and I go beyond the surface and I get invited into the supernatural. And right there in the target, I say, but could I pray for you? But, but you're a black man and I'm an Egyptian woman and, and I'm married and you're married. You shouldn't be praying for me here. And I say, well, just allow it to be so that we can fulfill the righteousness of God right now. I'm not even going to make it a big Pentecostal prayer. It'll be a little Methodist prayer. But let me, <laughs> let me pray for you. And when God moves in a natural place, in a supernatural way, people talk. Can, can, can I show you this? Look, look down at verse 20. Let's go further. The, she tries to throw up some defenses. She says, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. See, they were digging more into their differences. She was. He, he's reaching in her heart. She's throwing up walls. Verse 21, Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain that you revere because Jacob's well is here and Jacob gave this to you, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. I'll take down our idols too. Verse 22, you worship you know not what, little dig. We what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. We know what we worship. And he's telling the truth. The womb that Jesus came through was the nation of Israel. He's right. But the hour cometh. And when? Well, if it was then, it surely is now. But the hour cometh and what? If it was then, it surely is now. The hour cometh and now is what hour? When the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Not in your tradition, not in your historical experience, not in what your daddy said. I'm telling you, your daddy is wrong right now. Not, not, in, not in your Baptist tradition, not in your Methodist tradition, but you will worship in spirit and in truth. In fact, I'm here right now standing in Samaria next to this well having this conversation with you because the spirit brought me here and now I'm sharing truth. This is what he's saying because tradition would have had me go through Perea. I would have never met you, sis, but I'm standing here now telling you with five dudes and with one more because I didn't let tradition lead me. I let God lead me. 
I didn't let our cultural preferences, which told me which way to go, but instead of following them, I followed God. He led me. We're talking. I'm here. I'm in your heart. I know your issues. Stop throwing up your walls about we were all your religious stuff. I'm talking to you. I want to live like this, Jesus. I, I, I want to be like this, Jesus. This, this is my prayer as we go through these passages today. And not only do I want to live and be like this, I want to live with a people that are like this. I want to be with a people that are like this. I want your church to arise again. I want your body to be alive again. I want you to get the miracle that you gave your life for, Jesus, that if they had known who you were, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Because if they had known who you were, they would have known that if they crucified you, that your spirit would go take residence in a body of people. And there'd be many that are like Jesus instead of just one. He goes on at verse 24. Let me finish 23. It says, the father seeketh. What is the father doing? The father seeketh such to worship him. What is the father seeking to worship him? Those that will worship him in spirit and in. Are you willing to be that today? The woman now, oh. The woman now says to him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. And when he has come, he will tell us all things. This is one of the rare times Jesus ever did this. Jesus said in her, I that speak unto thee. He would speak to other people and ask them, who am I? And then when they revealed who he was, he said, don't tell anybody. He'd be in another place, he'd heal people, heal the blind man, and then say, don't tell who did it. But now when he's on the side with the other, I'm telling you, this, the supernatural gifting that you're looking for is on the other side more often than it's on the side where you're safe, with the people you know, with the people that think like you and look like you and act like you and prefer like you and live with you. But it's something about being on the other side that creates a dependency on him that brings you to the place that what was natural becomes supernatural. Jesus said in her, I that speak unto thee am he. I love how God works because the timing was all divine. The Holy Spirit leads him to go over there. At the same time, the guys that were with him go off to get something to eat. Because if they had been there, this moment would have never happened. They go off and get some need. He ends up at noon right at the right place, at the right time, talking to the right woman. It was a pivotal moment and a divine connection because he followed God. When we leave here, will we follow God like that? No, I'm asking, when we leave here, would you be willing to follow God like that? I, I was going to go to the Target later, but I just feel like I should go to the Target now. Would you just go earlier? I, I, I wasn't going to go to that Wawa. I was going to go to this Wawa. This one's a little inconvenient. But I just kind of feel strongly impressed upon me to go. Would you just go to that one? Would, would you linger at the coffee a little longer? Maybe the person next to you start with little conversation and then see if little might become much. Would, would you become alive? unto what God is doing rather than being stuck in what you're doing. If you want an exciting life, this is where it's at, baby. This is how it happens right here. So right at the moment when all was done, he revealed who he was at verse 27. And, and, and upon this, upon what? Soon as he got out of his mouth, I that speaketh unto thee is, am he. Here they come walking up. And upon this came his disciples and marveled. In other words, shocked and appalled. What? <laughs> that he talked with the, the Samaritan. He was talking with this woman. Yet no man said, what seeketh thou? Or why talkest you with her? You know, sometimes you're embarrassed about your judgments. And you don't want to just speak them out. But you're wondering, like, what? what? You know, what's going on? But the woman, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, you know, she had an interesting relationship with the men in the community. So she, so she goes and says to the men, come and see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed, or they kept asking and inquiring of him, saying, Master, eat. You know, they all sitting around eating their hoagies, eating their stuff. And like, you know, geez, we got a little something for you. There go yours. But listen what he says. 
But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. See, you keep trying to get your contentment and fulfillment from what you can buy. You keep trying to get your contentment and fulfillment from what you can do. You keep missing the divine appointments and the pivotal moments, so you need to take three, four, five vacations a year to feel some joy and some sense of being alive. But I have meat that you know not of. Therefore, his disciples start looking around at each other, and verse 30 says, who gave him something to eat? I know we ain't walk all the way down there to get this food, and one of y'all trying to get brownie points and I snuck him a sandwich. Who did this? I know it was you, Peter. You done slipped him a fish sandwich while we took the walk, and you now trying to be the lead of everything. But verse 34, Jesus said unto them, he makes it clear, my meat. Meat means my fulfillment. What makes me satisfied? What makes me full? What makes me feel good? What brings me joy? My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So are we ready to start getting the meat that comes from heaven? So often people say, well, I left that church because they wasn't feeding me meat no more and I needed some meat. Do you know what meat is? The reason why we left was because we were there listening but not doing the will of the Father. And, we, and because we weren't doing the will of the Father, we started looking around for things to pick on and pick at and not be happy about. But if I were busy with my meat, boy, all I would be is... So, Lord, I thank you for tearing down walls that exist in our hearts. Lord, I thank you for opening up eyes that had been blind. Some people we don't even see. Some people we just flat out avoid because of conclusions we've come to. And it's not even all ethnic and racial. Some of it is experiential. My dad beat up on me so much about my weight that now that I've lost some weight, every time I see a person who's overweight, I come to a critical judgment about them. Deliver me. My parents beat up on me so much about getting education. When I meet somebody that doesn't have more than a bachelor's degree, I judge them and say, what good could come out of an uneducated person? Deliver me. I talked so bad about that neighborhood and I had a negative experience with a person that came out of that neighborhood that I labeled everybody that comes out of that neighborhood and looks like somebody that comes out of that neighborhood, but it's hindered me from doing your work. Deliver me. I have been living a meatless existence and I'm withering away, but I want to stand at the well. I want to go beyond natural conversations, and I want to eat of your heavenly meat by faith in the mighty name of Jesus. Are you ready to live this? Are you ready to live this? Are you ready to live this?